Hello, this is Renee Whitehouse, and you're listening to the Archaeology Podcast. The most interesting things can be found in the most unlikely of places. In an ordinary suburb in San Jose, California, there stands a very unusual set of buildings. The original single building was built in the 1920s, but today the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum contains the largest collection of Egyptian artifacts west of the Mississippi. With more and more artifacts being collected from the 1940s to the 1960s, along with the remodeled expansion of the main building, new buildings were erected to house them all in the early 1960s, featuring a tomb that can still cause fear in guests who visit. This replica tomb, which was produced from a collection of common tombs from the Beni Hassan necropolis in ancient Egypt, which is located 20 kilometers, 12 miles south of the modern city of Minya in Middle Egypt, is dedicated to Khnumhotep II. Khnumhotep, which means Khnum is pleased, lived during an amazing time in Egypt. The first intermediate period had already ended in 2055 BCE, giving way to the 11th dynasty, the first of the Middle Kingdom. Under the pharaoh's ultimate rule, the regions of Egypt, called Nomes, or Sapat in ancient Egyptian, were under the more direct control of nomarchs, similar to governors today. Khnumhotep II was one of these nomarchs during the 12th dynasty and represented the Oryx Nome, the 16th of Upper Egypt. Buried in his elaborate tomb 4,000 years ago, Khnumhotep II surrounded himself with treasures, carvings, and paintings, all things that would help him create and navigate to his perfect afterlife in the underworld. As this all needed to be completed long before he passed, Khnumhotep II hired many artisans to complete the work as quickly as possible. Carving out the sandstone from beneath the mountain, they created passageways, large halls, and staircases, all leading to the final resting place. Before creating what is now called Tomb 3, or BH3, Beni Hassan 3, the artisans had to find the perfect location. The mountains, as natural pyramids, were an easier and less labor-intensive way to represent the sun's rays, the gift from Ra, and the path to the heavens. While many mountain ranges are made up of igneous or metamorphic rock, the range in which the 39 rock-cut tombs of Beni Hassan were carved is sedimentary. Being an easier medium to carve into, you know the workers didn't take that for granted. Walking up to the doorway, the hieroglyph carving becomes clear. It's a prayer, praising the gods and asking them to give favor to Khnumhotep. For this inscription, the glyphs are read from right to left, in the direction that the glyphs are facing, almost as if you were having a conversation with them. So the first line and a half, approximately, reads, all hail the sun god Ra, who rises in the sky's eastern horizon. Behold, behold, Khnumhotep. Khnumhotep's biography is recorded in the inner doorway. He was a member of a powerful family of nomarchs and officials, which was likely founded by his grandfather, Khnumhotep I, and housed in Menat Khufu. Khnumhotep II, Khnumhotep II, which this tomb is dedicated to, held many titles such as hereditary prince and count, foremost of actions, royal or sealer, sole friend, member of the elite, overlord of Nekeb, and overseer of the eastern desert, a position which he held from year 19 of Amenemhat II's reign until at least year 6 of Sinusret II's the date which appears in this Khnumhotep's tomb. Like most nomarchs at the time, he also held some priestly charges. Khnumhotep had two wives, the first of whom was Keti, daughter of an unnamed nomarch of the neighboring 17th gnome. Keti, like her husband, possessed numerous titles, including the daughter of the governor, king's acquaintance, foremost of actions, lady of the house, and was a priestess of Hathor and Paquette. 
Tiats, Kanemotep's secondary wife, held modest titles such as a sealer, but was the only known female sealer in a local governor's court. She also held lady of the house and one who knows her lord. These differences in title amounts, coupled by the fact that both consorts occur multiple times in Kanumotep's tomb, imply that the one between him and Keti might have more been a politically planned marriage, while Tiat might have been a true love who was appointed sealer by him just to be closer to her. But we can never really know for sure. It's not like it was written in stone. Walking carefully on the uneven chiseled ground, you're entering the first passage. Here, the darkness surrounds you, blending into the walls with the ceiling and on the floor. It's like a portal, leading you to a room lit with torches and lined with four columns. These carved columns are made to look like papyrus reed bundles, and they bring nature and possibly a bit of home into the first chamber. This room is the last that would have been open to the family and is made to bridge the gap between the living and the dead. In Egyptian mythology, the afterlife is not the end of life especially if you are rich and powerful. It's more of a continuation, or rather, it's whatever you want it to be. But because your spirit is still alive, it does still need to eat. To keep the ka alive, families bring food and drink to put in or next to the offering bowl in front of a false door. It's a stone-carved optical illusion, which mimics a hallway to the afterlife where the deceased's soul could pass through. But instead of leaving the food there to rot, the family would bless the food by reciting specific incantations to release the food and water spirit. And then, after that ritual was over, they take it outside to have kind of a family reunion picnic. In some cases, a priest would have been paid to enact these rituals if the family was too far away to do it themselves. In those cases, a local priest would bring the food and water for the rituals and then head back to the temple with them once the job was complete. Sometimes, neither the family nor any priest could perform the rituals to feed the ka. For times like that, Kanumotep and other leaders like him and the artisans that they worked with followed a contingency plan. On the wall opposite of the false doorway is a large carving depicting Kanumotep II sitting in front of a table piled high with bread, which doesn't really look like bread in the picture. It's the stuff that's standing vertically on the table. Next to that is a bird, there's a bowl, two pigs, and so much more. Underneath the table are containers of wine, beer, and oils. While Kanumotep has all of his favorite foods, he made sure his pet monkey, as carved beneath the chair, has some good food too because he's eating dates out of a bowl because Kanumotep wants to make sure he has his best friend with him for all eternity. Finally, the hieroglyphs around the top of the relief are the incantations needed to bring out the spirit of the food. But the carving here is incomplete, most likely because the original is unreadable. This is all extremely useful because the ancient Egyptians believed that anything carved, sculpted, or painted within the tomb becomes real in the afterlife. And therefore, with this relief, Kanumotep II's ka would be fed for all eternity. At the interior end of the first room, there is another doorway, which would have been sealed after the body was initially buried to help prevent grave robberies. Through this now open passage, 11 stone steps lead down to the burial chamber, where the walls and ceiling are covered in colorful paintings. These paintings tell the story of how Kanumotep II will spend eternity and how he'll get there. In the middle of the room is a pit with a raised empty sarcophagus to symbolize the common occurrence of grave robbery. Grave robbing was often performed by the very builders that worked on the tomb because they knew all the tricks and all the secrets because they helped build them. 
the sarcophagi and internal coffins were broken into routinely because they put amulets and jewelry within multiple layers of the mummy's wrappings, such as the heart scarab Kepri. This is also why there is a rectangular cutout section in the middle of the eastern wall. The builders came back to find the statue that they would have hidden in it. Starting with the eastern wall, this is the wall of the morning or of daily life. Here, Kanumotep II continues his duties as a nomarch, watching over his servants on the land that stretches from the Nile to the mountains. In this world, the animals and people are created through the painting, like shadows, so no real people or animals have to suffer or die to create a perfect afterlife for another. The only other real person in these paintings is the woman standing behind Kanumotep on an elevated platform. This is his wife, although I'm not really sure which one. The elevated platform and the fact that her legs are painted together rather than how Kanumotep is shown in the elevated platform means that she died before her husband and before the room was ever painted. Above and in front of Kanumotep II, there are lines of animals, both real and fictional, including the possibly real or maybe fictional animal that the god Set has the head of, and they are living as animals do, doing everything that animals do. And they are being taken care of by the farmers, the fishermen, and the artisans. Further to the right end of the painting, the shadow people are celebrating, dancing, carrying on a circus, and just wonderfully enjoying their shadow afterlives. At the top right corner of the eastern wall, this is the only place where the paintings are incomplete. This suggests that Kanumotep died at least 70 days before the paintings were finished, because this is how long it takes to mummify a body and the body must be buried once the process is complete. But, instead of leaving the work area blank, the artist depicted an artist painting on the wall as a promise to return to complete the work in his afterlife. Or at least have an artisan come in and finish the work. The south wall shows two versions of Kanumotep taking part in his two favorite activities, hunting and fishing. On each side of the wall, he is standing on top of his Nile boats made of bound reeds. At the same time, he is bragging about himself and his skills and making sure that he stays young and strong forever. He is also showing that he creates ma'at or order and justice from chaos. Diving deeper into the meaning of this wall of the mural, the attributes that Kanumotep displays demonstrate that Ma'at, via the change from the chaos of the birds flying in every direction as they are frightened by his hunting cats, in opposition to the depictions of Kanumotep holding onto the birds. On the left, he has lined up three birds in one hand, and on the right, he speared two fish with one hit. Additionally, the river below is full of fish, along with other animals such as the dangerous hippopotamus, which can be seen underneath the front of the boat on the right side. On the boats, there are both male and female servants. They are depicted as much smaller than Kanumotep because he is the leader, and thus greater than the people who serve him. On the western wall, or the wall of death, the setting sun, and the afterlife, this is where Kanumotep's journey truly begins. Here, he must prove himself pure of heart before he will be welcomed into the afterlife by the god Osiris. In this painting, unlike the others, Kanumotep and his wife are finely dressed to impress the gods in front of them. All of the gods moving from left to right, how we identified them at the museum, were Seshat, who is the goddess of poetry and music, possibly a tomb, Ma'at, Horus, who is holding a bowl with the Ankh and the ritual ads for the mouth opening ceremony, Isis, Kanum, Wadiet, who is a goddess of protection for the pharaoh, Osiris, who is standing on the platform just like Kanumotep's wife because he is also dead as he is the god of death, Sekhmet, 
Sobek, and Ra, who is kind of small at the back, up on an elevated platform, either because he is usually on the solar barge, or because they ran out of room, maybe both. And you can see that all the gods are holding an ankh in one of their hands, except for Osiris, because as the god of death, he is dead, technically, and therefore is not immortal. In Egyptian mythology, there are tests that need to be passed. While many tombs have different portions of the journey to the afterlife, kind of like a cheat sheet for a test, this particular tomb depicts what might be the most well-known of these tests, the heart weighing ceremony. It begins with a series of 42 questions, one from each of the 42 main gods and goddesses, which are all recorded by the god of knowledge and writing, Toth or Thoth. All of these can only be answered honestly, as it is believed that it was not possible to lie to the gods, even if you wanted to. And all of the answers had to be no. For example, the question would be, have you ever killed anyone? And the way that you would answer that must be, Hail Isis, no, I have never killed anyone. The questions would continue and become more difficult to answer no to. Questions like, have you ever lied? And who among us can say that we've never lied before? With each yes, the heart, which is weighed against an ostrich feather on the scales of Ma'at, becomes increasingly heavy. If the heart were ever to touch the ground, the demon goddess Amut the Devourer, who is an amalgamation of a crocodile head, the upper body of a lion, and the lower body of the hippo, will eat the heart, and the person, along with their soul, would just cease to exist. But Kanumotep prepared for everything. By giving a little bit extra praise to Anubis, the jackal-headed god of mummification, Kanumotep was able to secure a little bit of help as he tries to win the favor of the gods in the heart wearing ceremony. Anubis is painted adding a weight to the side of the scales with the feather in case Kanumotep has done some things that would weigh on his heart. And because the next panel is drawn, the heart proves to be light enough to pass the test. After the heart wang ceremony, Horus leads Kanumotep to his afterlife, where Osiris, the hero god of the underworld, Isis, his wife and sister, and Nephthys, their other sister, are all waiting to welcome him to paradise. In front of the seated Osiris is a huge eye with a bird body holding a feather staff. This is a depiction of Kanumotep's Ba, the personality, another part of the soul, which would normally be sailing on Ra's solar barge through the underworld. Underneath the eye bird are the four sons of Horus standing on a lotus flower shown like they would appear on canopic jars. Imseti would hold the liver, Hapi the lungs, Dwamotef the stomach, and Kebetsanuf the intestines. Running the length of the majority of the west and north walls, there are also paintings near the ceiling depicting the process of mummification as performed by the priests of Anubis. The final step of this is on the west corner of the north wall, in which a priest, wearing the mask head of Anubis, is blessing the body before it is finally interred into the tomb. The following images show a procession of people, likely servants, bringing flowers and gifts to the tomb. Also, the text underneath the line of gods and the heart weighing ceremony would have been full passages from the Book of the Dead, the guidebook for souls to make it into the field of reeds. The last painted section in the burial is on the ceiling. The goddess of the heavens, Nut, is stretched across the sky wearing her gown of stars. She is said to give birth to the sun each morning and swallow it again each night while giving birth to the moon. This cycle encapsulates every generation's birth, death, and rebirth, and how Nut will watch over and protect this burial. Around the room, there are multiple holes in the plaster and cracks in the bedrock. These were found in the original rock-cut tombs and likely occurred when earthquakes struck. 
Of course, because this replica is only a few rooms in a small museum, multiple rooms and many murals were left out. But this tomb, composite or not, is a perfect example for people to learn about the cultural importance of the journey to the Egyptian afterlife. It may look frightening on the outside, but inside, the ancient Egyptians only wanted to bring nature, protection, family, fun, and love along with them for all eternity. The general information that I was working with for this came from working as a tour guide and the script that we had to memorize. But I followed it up with further research and going down a few rabbit holes. If you live near or plan ever to visit San Jose, California, be sure to stop by and see this museum that's located at 1660 Park Avenue. For the rest of you, check out the 3D walkthrough by heading over to the Egyptian Museum's website at egyptianmuseum.org. Though, if I could get on my soapbox for a moment, while I love this museum, and I've been going there since I was a kid and how it tries to educate people and gives hundreds of students full tours almost every single day. This museum probably shouldn't exist anymore. At least not how it is right now. Fulfilling reparations is a very nuanced issue. I think it is very important especially because many of the artifacts that were stolen in the, in the 20s and 30s are still just sitting in the back inside closets. Unless the museum has done massive renovations in the past couple years, which would be great, even artifacts on display aren't treated really as they should be, the display cases aren't properly sealed, and though we would go through the museum and record the temperatures and humidities a few times a day, nothing would be done to regulate these variables, except for generally keeping the museum cool. This oversight causes the stonework to slowly disintegrate. The people working and volunteering at the museum are wonderful, but at least when I worked there, the owners didn't really seem to care about the artifacts or the Egyptian history that they are allowing to be destroyed. They really only care about the Rosicrucian side of it. The importance of preservation for the future is extremely important, and especially when that can coincide with giving things back to the proper owners, that's an easy decision. But whether fortunately or unfortunately, it's not my choice to make. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Archaeology, and I hope you enjoyed our journey into a mysterious ancient Egyptian tomb, or at least a replica of one. For another week, I'd like to thank you for putting up with my pronunciation. Once again, I am working on it. One of the reasons why I'm having so much trouble saying ancient Egyptian words properly is one, because I'm not an expert, and two, is because we don't really know how they were said. The way they're written, they don't have any vowels in them, so we kind of have to guess. But most of the time, while the original translations aren't written with vowels, they are written out phonetically. So I've been tending to follow that. It just seems like the best idea. The phonetics tend to come from educated guesses based on how other words would have sounded in Demotic or Coptic languages. And then how it translates to Ancient Greek. That's how we understood the Rosetta Stone and deciphered hieroglyphics in the first place. Thank you, Jean-Francois Jambouillon. All the music comes from Scott Buckley at scottbuckley.com.au. Once again, I'm glad you could join me on this captivating journey through the art and symbolism of ancient cultures. If you enjoyed today's episode, and if you'd like to stay up to date on my latest content, make sure to subscribe to my podcast. I love to hear your thoughts and feedback, so please leave a comment or a view or just like it. Your support means the world to me and helps me continue sharing these incredible stories. For more fascinating art history insights, please visit my website and don't forget to follow me on social media for all the latest updates. You'll get to see my articles and also my pieces of art. So stay curious and stay inspired. And until next time, 
Keep taking those detours. Thanks again.